Hans the Mermaid's Son, from the Pink Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. In a village there once lived a smith called Basmus, who was in a very poor way. He was still a young man and a strong, handsome fellow to boot, but he had many little children, and there was little to be earned by his trade. He was, however, a diligent and hard-working man, and when he had no work in the smithy, he was out at sea fishing or gathering wreckage on the shore. It happened one time that he had gone out to fish in good weather, all alone in a little boat, but he did not come home that day, nor the following one, so that all believed he had perished out at sea. On the third day, however, Basmus came to shore again, and had his boat full of fish, so big and fat that no one had ever seen their like. There was nothing the matter with him, and he complained neither of hunger or thirst. He had got into a fog, he said, and could not find land again. What he did not tell, however, was where he had been all the time. That only came out six years later, when people got to know that he had been caught by a mermaid out on the deep sea, and had been her guest during the three days that he was missing. From that time forth he went out no more to fish, nor, indeed, did he require to do so, for whenever he went down to the shore it never failed that some wreckage was washed up, and in it all kinds of valuable things. In those days everyone took what they found and got leave to keep it, so that the smith grew more prosperous day by day. When seven years had passed since the smith went out to sea, it happened one morning, as he stood in the smithy, mending a plough, that a handsome young lad came in to him and said, "'Good day, father. My mother the mermaid sends her greetings, and says that she has had me for six years now, and you can keep me for as long.' He was a strange enough boy to be six years old, for he looked as if he were eighteen, and was even bigger and stronger than lads commonly are at that age. "'Will you have a bite of bread?' said the smith. "'Oh, yes,' said Hans, for that was his name. The smith then told his wife to cut a piece of bread for him. She did so, and the boy swallowed it at one mouthful and went out again to the smithy to his father. "'Have you got all you can eat?' said the smithy. No, said Hans, that was just a little bit. The smith went into the house and took a whole loaf, which he cut into two slices and put butter and cheese between them, and this he gave to Hans. In a while the boy came out to the smithy again. Well, have you got as much as you can eat, said the smith? No, not nearly, said Hans. I must try to find a better place than this, for I can see that I shall never get my fill here. Hans wished to set off at once, as soon as his father would make a staff for him of such a kind as he wanted. "'It must be of iron,' said he, "'and one that can hold out.' The smith brought him an iron rod as thick as an ordinary staff, but Hans took it and twisted it round his finger, so that wouldn't do. Then the smith came dragging one as thick as a wagon pole, but Hans bent it over his knee and broke it like a straw.' The smith then had to collect all the iron he had, and Hans held it while his father forged for him a staff, which was heavier than the anvil. When Hans had got this, he said, "'Many thanks, father. Now I have got my inheritance.' With this he set off into the country, and the smith was very pleased to be rid of that son before he ate him out of house and home." Hans first arrived at a large estate, and it so happened that the squire himself was standing outside the farmyard. "'Where are you going?' said the squire. "'I am looking for a place,' said Hans, "'where they have need of strong fellows, and can give them plenty to eat.' "'Well,' said the squire, "'I generally have twenty-four men at this time of the year, but I have only twelve just now, so I can easily take you on.' "'Very well,' said Hans. "'I shall easily do twelve men's work, "'but then I must also have as much to eat as the twelve would.' "'All this was agreed to, "'and the squire took Hans into the kitchen "'and told the servant girls "'that the new man was to have as much food "'as the other twelve. "'It was arranged that he should have a pot to himself, "'and he could then use the ladle to take his food with. "'It was in the evening that Hans arrived there, "'so he did nothing more that day than eat his supper.' 
a big pot of buckwheat porridge, which he cleaned to the bottom, and was then so far satisfied that he said he could sleep on that, so he went off to bed. He slept both well and long, and all the rest were up and at their work while he was still sleeping soundly. The squire was also on foot, for he was curious to see how the new man would behave who was both to eat and work for twelve. But as yet there was no Hans to be seen, and the sun was already high in the heavens, so the squire himself went and called on him. "'Get up, Hans!' he cried. "'You are sleeping too long!' Hans woke up and rubbed his eyes. "'Yes, that's true,' he said. "'I must get up and have my breakfast.' So he rose and dressed himself and went into the kitchen where he got his pot of porridge. He swallowed all of this and then asked what work he was to have. "'He was to thresh that day,' said the squire. "'The other twelve men were already busy at it. "'There were twelve threshing floors, "'and the twelve men were at work on six of them, two on each. "'Hans must thresh by himself "'all that was lying upon the other six floors. "'He went out to the barn and got hold of a flail. "'Then he looked to see how the others did it and did the same. "'But at the first stroke he smashed the flail in pieces.' There were several flails hanging there, and Hans took the one after the other, but they all went the same way, every one flying in splinters at the first stroke. He then looked round for something else to work with, and found a pair of strong beams lying near. Next he caught sight of a horse hide nailed up on the barn door. With the beams he made a flail, using the skin to tie them together. The one beam he used as a handle, and the other to strike with, and now that was all right. But the barn was too low. There was no room to swing the flail, and the floors were too small. Hans, however, found a remedy for this. He simply lifted the whole roof off the barn, and set it down in the field beside. He then emptied down all the corn that he could lay his hands on, and threshed away. He went through one lot after another, and it was all the same to him what he got hold of, so before midday he had threshed all the squire's grain, his rye and wheat and barley and oats, all mixed through each other. When he was finished with this, he lifted the roof up on the barn again, like setting a lid on a box, and went in and told the squire that the job was done. The squire opened his eyes at this announcement, and came out to see if it was really true. It was true, sure enough, but he was scarcely delighted with the mixed grain that he got from all his crops. However, when he saw the flail that Hans had used, and learned how he had made room for himself to swing it, he was so afraid of the strong fellow that he dared not say anything, except that it was a good thing he had got it threshed, but it had still to be cleaned." "'What does that mean?' asked Hans. "'It was explained to him that the corn and the chaff had to be separated, "'as yet both were lying in one heap, right up to the roof. "'Hans began to take up a little and sift it in his hands, "'but he soon saw that this would never do. "'He soon thought of a plan, however. "'He opened both barn doors and then lay down at one end and blew, "'so that all the chaff flew out and lay like a sandbank at the other end of the barn, "'and the grain was as clean as it could be. "'Then he reported to the squire that that job also was done. "'The squire said that that was well. "'There was nothing more for him to do that day. "'Off went Hans to the kitchen and got as much as he could eat.' Then he went and took a midday nap, which lasted till supper time. Meanwhile, the squire was quite miserable and made his moan to his wife, saying that she must help him to find some means to getting rid of this strong fellow, for he durst not give him his leave. She sent for the steward, and it was arranged that next day all the men should go to the forest for firewood, and that they should make a bargain among them, that the one who came home last with his load should be hanged. They thought they could easily manage that it would be Hans who would lose his life, for the others would be early on the road, while Hans would certainly oversleep himself. In the evening, therefore, the men sat and talked together, saying that next morning they must set out early to the forest, and as they had a hard day's work and a long journey before them, they would, for their amusement, make a compact, that whichever them came home last with his load should lose his life on the gallows. So Hans had no objections to make. 
Long before the sun was up next morning, all the twelve men were on foot. They took all the best horses and carts and drove off to the forest. Hans, however, lay and slept on, and the squire said, Just let him lie. At last Hans thought it was time to have his breakfast, so he got up and put on his clothes. He took plenty of time to his breakfast and then went out to get his horse and cart ready. The others had taken everything that was any good, so that he had a difficulty in scraping together four wheels of different sizes and fixing them to an old cart, and he could find no other horses than a pair of old hacks. He did not know where it lay, but he followed the track of the other carts, and in that way came to it all right. On coming to the gate leading into the forest, he was unfortunate enough to break it in pieces, so he took a huge stone that was lying on the field, seven ells long and seven ells broad, and set this in the gap. Then he went on and joined the others. These laughed at him heartily, for they had labored as hard as they could since daybreak, and had helped each other to fell trees and put them on the carts, so that all of these were now loaded except one. Hans got hold of a woodman's axe and proceeded to fell a tree, but he destroyed the edge and broke the shaft at the first blow. He therefore laid down the axe, put his arms round the tree, and pulled it up by the roots. This he threw upon his cart, and then another and another, and thus he went on while all the others forgot their work and stood with open mouths, gazing at this strange woodcraft. All at once they began to hurry. The last cart was loaded, and they whipped up their horses so as to be the first to arrive home. When Hans had finished his work, he again put his old hacks into the cart, but they could not move it from the spot. He was annoyed at this, and took them out again, twisted a rope round the cart, and all the trees lifted the whole affair on his back and set off home, leading the horses behind him by the rein. When he reached the gate, he found the whole row of carts standing there, unable to get any further for the stone which lay in the gap. What? said Hans. Can twelve men not move that stone? With that, he lifted it and threw it out of the way. And went on with his burden on his back and the horses behind him, and arrived at the farm long before any of the others. The squire was walking about there, looking and looking, for he was very curious to know what had happened. Finally, he caught sight of Hans coming along in this fashion, and was so frightened that he did not know what to do. But he shut the gate and put on the bar. When Hans reached the gate of the courtyard, he laid down the trees and hammered at it, but no one came to open it. He then took the trees and tossed them over the barn into the yard, and the cart after them, so that every wheel flew off in a different direction. When the squire saw this, he thought to himself, The horses will come the same way if I don't open the door. So he did this. Good day, master, said Hans, and put the horses into the stable, and went into the kitchen to get something to eat. At length the other men came home with their loads. When they came in, Hans said to them, Do you remember the bargain we made last night? Which of you is it that's going to be hanged? Oh, said they, that was only a joke. It didn't mean anything. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, said Hans, and there was no more about it. The squire, however, and his wife and the steward had much to say to each other about the terrible man they had got, and all were agreed that they must get rid of him in some way or other. The steward said that he would manage this all right. Next morning they were to clean the well, and they would use of that opportunity. They would get him down into the well, and then have a big millstone ready to throw down on top of him. That would settle him. After that, they could just fill in the well, and then escape being at any expense for his funeral. Both the squire and his wife thought this a splendid idea, and went about rejoicing at the thought that now they would get rid of Hans. But Hans was hard to kill, as we shall see. He slept long next morning, as he always did, and finally, as he would not waken by himself, the squire had to go and call him. Get up, Hans, you are sleeping too long, he cried. Hans woke up and rubbed his eyes. That's so, said he. I shall rise and have my breakfast. 
He got up then and dressed himself, while the breakfast stood waiting for him. When he had finished the whole of this, he asked what he was to do that day. He was told to help the other men to clean out the well. That was all right, and he went out and found the other men waiting for him. To these he said that they could choose whichever task they liked, either to go down into the well and fill the buckets while he pulled them up, or pull them up and he alone would go down to the bottom of the well. They answered that they would rather stay above ground, as there would be no room for so many of them down in the well. Hans therefore went down alone and began to clean out the well, but the men had arranged how they were to act, and immediately each of them seized a stone from a heap of huge blocks and threw them down above him, thinking to kill him with these. Hans, however, gave no more heed to this than to shout up to them to keep the hens away from the well, for they were scraping gravel down on the top of him. They then saw that they could not kill him with little stones, but they had still the big one left. The whole twelve of them set to work with poles and rollers and rolled the big millstone to the brink of the well. It was with the greatest difficulty that they got it thrown down there, and now they had no doubt that he had got all that he wanted. But the stone happened to fall so luckily that his head went right through the hole in the middle of the millstone, so that it sat round his neck like a priest's collar. At this, Hans would stay down no longer. He came out of the well with the millstone round his neck. and went straight to the squire and complained that the other men were trying to make a fool of him. He would not be their priest, he said. He had too little learning for that. Saying this, he bent down his head and shook the stone off so that it crushed one of the squire's big toes. The squire went limping in to his wife, and the steward was sent for. He was told that he must devise some plan for getting rid of this terrible person. The scheme he had devised before had been of no use, and now good counsel was scarce. Oh, no, said the steward, there are good enough ways yet. The squire can send him this evening to fish in Devil Moss Lake. He will never escape alive from there, for no one can go there by night for old Eric. That was a grand idea, both the squire and his wife thought, and so he limped out again to Hans and said that he would punish his men for having tried to make a fool of him. Meanwhile, Hans could do a little job where he would be free from these rascals. He should go out on the lake and fish there that night, and would then be free from all work on the following day. All right, said Hans, I am well content with that, but I must have something with me to eat a baking of bread, a cask of butter, a barrel of ale, and a keg of brandy. I can't do with less than that. The squire said that he could easily get all that, so Hans got all of these tied up together, hung them over his shoulder on his good staff, and tramped away to Devil Moss Lake. There he got into the boat, rowed out upon the lake, and got everything ready to fish. As he now lay out there in the middle of the lake, and it was pretty late in the evening, he thought he would have something to eat first before starting to work. Just as he was at his busiest with this, old Eric rose out of the lake, caught him by the cuff of the neck, whipped him out of the boat, and dragged him down to the bottom. It was a lucky thing that Hans had his walking stick with him that day, and had just time to catch hold of it when he felt old Eric's claws in his neck. So when they got down to the bottom, he said, Stop now, just wait a little. Here is solid ground. With that, he caught old Eric by the back of the neck with one hand, and hammered away on his back with the staff, till he beat him out as flat as a pancake. Old Eric then began to lament and howl, begging him just to let him go, and he would never come back to the lake again. No, my good fellow, said Hans, you won't get off until you promise to bring all the fish in the lake up to the squire's courtyard before tomorrow morning. Old Eric eagerly promised this, if Hans would only let him go. So Hans rowed ashore, ate up the rest of his provisions, and went home to bed. Next morning, when the squire rose and opened his front door, the fish came tumbling into the porch, and the whole yard was crammed full of them. 
he ran in again to his wife, for he could never devise anything himself, and said to her, "'What shall we do with him now? Old Eric hasn't taken him. I am certain that all the fish are out of the lake, for the yard is just filled with them.' "'Yes, that's a bad business,' said she. "'You must see if you can't get him sent to purgatory to demand tribute.' The squire therefore made his way to the men's quarters to speak to Hans, and it took him all his time to push his way along the walls, under the eaves, on account of the fish that filled the yard. He thanked Hans for having fished so well, and said that now he had an errand for him, which he could only give to a trusty servant, and that was to journey to purgatory and demand three years' tribute, which he said was owing to him from that quarter." "'Willingly,' said Hans, "'but what road do I go to get there?' The squire stood and did not know what to say, and had first to go in to his wife to ask her. "'Oh, what a fool you are,' said she. "'Can't you direct him straight forward south through the wood? "'Whether he gets there or not, we shall be quit of him.' Out goes the squire again to Hans. "'The way lies straight forward south through the wood,' said he. Hans then must have his provisions for the journey, two bakings of bread, two casks of butter, two barrels of ale, and two kegs of brandy. He tied all these up together, and got them on his shoulder, hanging on his good walking-stick, and off he tramped southward. After he had got through the wood, there was more than one road, and he was in doubt which of them was the right one, so he sat down and opened up his bundle of provisions. He found he had left his knife at home, but by good chance there was a plow lying close at hand, so he took the coulter of this to cut the bread with. As he sat there and took his bite, a man came riding past him. "'Where are you from?' said Hans. "'From Purgatory,' said the man. "'Then stop and wait a little,' said Hans, but the man was in a hurry and would not stop, so Hans ran after him and caught the horse by the tail.' This brought it down on its hind legs, and the man went flying over its head into a ditch. "'Just wait a little,' said Hans. "'I am going the same way.' He got his provisions tied up again and laid them on the horse's back. Then he took hold of the reins and said to the man, "'We too can go along together on foot.' As they went on their way, Hans told the stranger both about the errand he had on hand and the fun he had had with old Eric. The others said but little, but he was well acquainted with the way, and it was no long time before they arrived at the gate. There both horse and rider disappeared, and Hans was left alone outside. "'They will come and let me in presently,' he thought to himself, but no one came. He hammered at the gate. Still no one appeared. Then he got tired of waiting and smashed at the gate with his staff until he knocked it in pieces and got inside.' A whole troop of little demons came down upon him and asked what he wanted. His master's compliments, said Hans, and he wanted three years' tribute. At this they howled at him and were about to lay hold of him and drag him off. But when they had got some wraps from his walking stick, they let go again, howled still louder than before, and ran in to old Eric, who was still in bed, after his adventure in the lake. They told him that a messenger had come from the squire at Devilmoss to demand three years' tribute. He had knocked the gate to pieces and bruised their arms and legs with his iron staff. "'Give him three years! Give him ten! shouted old Eric. "'Only don't let him come near me!' So all the little demons came dragging so much silver and gold that it was something awful. Hans filled his bundle with gold and silver coins, put it on his neck, and tramped back to his master, who was scared beyond all measure at seeing him again. But Hans was also tired of service now. Of all the gold and silver he brought with him, he let the squire keep one half, and he was glad enough both for the money and at getting rid of Hans. The other half he took home to his father, the smith, in Furby. To him also he said farewell. He was now tired of living on shore among mortal men, and preferred to go home again to his mother. Since that time no one has ever seen Hans, the mermaid's son. The End